Waters Church, and I'm a professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School. I'm also a member of the Broad Institute and the Wies Institute. I was born on MacDill Air Force Base in 28th of August, 1954, in Tampa, Florida. Yeah, there's one teacher that I've acknowledged several times uh, publicly, which is uh, Creighton Bedford in ninth grade and 11th grade. He was my math uh, teacher, and he essentially let me off halfway through the year, both years, because <laughs> I have some combination of my narcolepsy and the fact that I was that I knew all the I seemed to know the material. So, um, so he he was big uh, influence uh, on me. Um, also, my photography teacher from tenth grade, uh, John Snyder, was uh, an amazing uh, influence. And then, uh, well, plenty of them uh, in in college and in graduate school, but notably Sung Ho Kim, who uh, um, transfer helped me transfer from my sophomore year in college to to graduate school. Well, I, I graduated in my sophomore year after working with him for a year, and then tried graduate school at Duke uh, with him, but then I flunked out um, because I wasn't paying attention to courses I had already taken. Kind of like high school, yeah. <laughs> and I worked as a technician for a year with Sung Ho. So I was with him as an undergraduate, graduate, and technician. And then he said, you probably want a PhD. So I, so I went uh, to Harvard to work with Wally Gilbert. Yeah, so I worked on uh, crystallography of the first folded nucleic acid transfer RNA, uh, which was the key to the genetic code, uh, and uh, uh, wrote some software that w during that time that was in use for 30 years um, thereafter. But I also did some experiments, but mostly software. Well, so some of the software I wrote as a crystallographer, I, I rewrote um, as a rotation student uh, at uh, Harvard, uh, again, in a crystallography lab, because they were the only labs that had scanners uh, that would, could scan films, and all data was collected on films at the time, both x-ray and uh, sequencing data. And, uh, and then that, that software, then I, that software was, uh, well, I was a consultant for BioRad for a brief while, and then it was completely rewritten um, for genome therapeutics um, uh, in, the, in the late 80s, early 90s, and they, they and others used it um, for part of the early stages of the Genome Project. I think it's a, a mystery why Harvard would accept me uh, after flunking out of Duke. Uh, usually it's the other way around, or, or, or nothing. Uh, um, I think it's because I was accepted at Harvard um, for an application in the previous years. And, uh, and also I had published five papers uh, during the time I was flunking out. I, I had been uh, uh, on, on transfer RNA and also on a, on a method, oh, sorry, a model for DNA protein interactions. And, and, oh, and, and then Wally, uh, he had come to Duke uh, for a day at the invitation of graduate students. I spent almost all day with him because I thought of an excuse that why I should be at every one of his meetings. Um, I don't think, it had much impression on him. He wasn't on the admissions committee or anything like that, but made a big impression on me. I was pretty, I was pretty sure even before he showed up that I, that I wanted to work in his lab and do DNA sequencing or, or possibly crystallography, but I decided on DNA sequencing. Well, yes, yeah, so while I was uh, doing the crystallography of tRNA, I, uh, there was one point we wanted to ask how general our crystal structure was, and it, did it apply to other tRNAs. So it, I typed in all the sequences it, available at the time, uh, which is not something you would do today, and uh, it took about an afternoon to type it. Almost all the sequences were tRNAs, and I typed them all in, including the modified bases, and I folded them up in the computer, and I said, wow, this is really cool. You know, I could get hundreds of, of 3D structures from one 3D structure and a lot of sequences, and so sequencing must be a lot easier, and it's just as good. And so, I, so I, I knew somebody who was doing RNA sequencing at the time at Duke, uh, a, a senior graduate student, and uh, I decided that I wanted to do something much better than much more higher throughput than that. Maybe sequence, you know, every every person's genome, um, and uh, so I didn't really 
do the math right away, but it, it seemed like it was plausible. And so anyway, I went, went to Wally's lab, which at the time, they were just beginning to do DNA sequencing. And so at that time, you know, sort of 50 base pairs was a big deal. Um, so we had a ways to go. <laughs> the main one that was in use, the, the one that I typed in all the sequences from, was RNA sequencing, where you would digest RNA, you would radio label it and digest it and run it out on paper chromatography or paper electrophoresis. And uh, there was a lot of radioactivity, typically, and uh, a lot of um, um, high voltage for the paper electrophoresis and uh, kerosene-like substance. And so this high voltage in paper and kerosene was in a room which had an automatically closing door and a bunch of CO2 jets to put out the fire, should that ever happen. Um, and so then, and then we started converting over to gel electrophoresis uh, due to work with Tom Maniatis and then, and then later in Wally's lab. That was in the mid-70s, uh, 77. It was we were well in the era of uh, gel electrophoresis. Well, so I, I think uh, the average student would flounder around for a few months trying to learn, even in a lab where you had protocols working. In labs where you didn't have protocols working, uh, it'd take maybe even longer. Um, but then once you were up to speed, uh, Greg Sutcliffe, the person who taught me sequencing, he was a sixth year student when I was a first year student. Was, um, he knocked off 4,000 base pair PBR322 uh, with a little bit of help from me in uh, about a year. So 4,000 base pairs in a year. And he was extraordinary. Fred Sanger was also extraordinary, but there weren't that many at that time. We almost never talked about cost other than when we ran out of acrylamide. And we, we used so much acrylamide that it was actually a big deal. It was like a $13,000 purchase order uh, because we got it in quantity and high purity. And we used a, a ridiculously large amount of it until Fred Sanger published his paper on how to use thin gels with thin lanes and low percentage of acrylamide. And he clearly was being cost, con cost conscious, but you wouldn't call that like a technology improvement. It was, it was like three obvious cost-saving things that by the way, also helped increase the read length. Um, <clears throat> and when I said that 4,000 was a typical length, I mean, most people were satisfied with, with like one run up of a, a, on a chest x-ray film, and so they might get 60 base pairs, and that would be their thesis um, um, uh, at the time that I entered the lab. Um, yeah. But the, in terms of communities, there really weren't that many. There were little communities centered around Wally Gilbert's lab and Fred Zanger's, and their trainees would slowly percolate out, and they'd send, or Wally's lab at least, would send out these uh, photocopied uh, in a very colorful uh, paper, a green and pink paper that they'd send out. Um, uh, so that people, I guess, so people could easily find them on their bench uh, among the clutter. Yeah. Well, in Wally's lab, <coughs> since it was one of the two centers, it was easy to find out what other people do. There was a little bit of traffic in between, very, very little. Um, in fact, uh, I was, I think I might have been the first person in Wally's lab to, to do Sanger method, and a number of people said, oh, you're going to be thrown out of the lab, you know, because, you know, that's the enemy. And I said, well, uh, we'll see. I, I don't think so. And uh, he, was, he, was, he was fine with it. Uh, but that was kind of the limit of the flow of information. Well, I mean, they, they, they were pretty independent, as far as I could tell. They both noticed the polyacrylamide electro gel electrophoresis on the denaturing gels that Tom had developed. And they tried it out with different ways of doing end labeling, meaning, so if you just throw out where you'd get a ladder, where the, each, each base was longer by one base pair each, so the ladder could either be terminated by a chemical cleavage or by um, a polymerase falling off. And, but they resulted in the same sort of thing, but they were wildly different methods. And Gilbert's uh, chemical sequencing uh, took off early. It was a little easier to implement on double-stranded DNA, which was what most people had, SV40, um, PBR plasmas like PBR322. Um, and Fred Sanger's was kind of restricted to single-stranded DNA, which PBR, sorry, uh, 
phi x174 and uh, G4 and M13 were a few examples. Uh, anyway, so almost everybody had a double stranded piece of DNA. They could label at one end. And so the chemistry took off for a while, but ultimately the dideoxy sequencing, um, once they had, once uh, Joe Messing introduced single stranded vectors that people could use, that took off um, because it was slightly higher quality. And, and no toxic chemicals. Still had P32 or S35. Uh, as I was leaving Duke, I was thinking about ways to change sequencing radically. And of course, this is not healthy for an incoming student because you just, just learn the protocols. But uh, the ideas I had kind of in a vacuum because I was in transition from one lab to another were, were, were uh, having to do multiplexing, how you can mix lots of things together so the same volume would do multiple reactions. And, uh, and I, I tried it a little bit during my rotation with Greg, and, he's, and he, he said, no, no, just, just finish your project on this plasmid. And I did, and I was fine, I was happy with that. And then I did one other project on, on RNA splicing. And then finally, I had a moment where I had to decide whether I was going to continue to do RNA splicing or, uh, or really follow my dream of this technology development. And, and I decided that the RNA splicing I was doing would maybe impact three or four people worldwide while a, a se sequencing could affect more. And so, uh, so I tried to, I figured the ultimate multiplexing would be the whole, do the whole genome in one tube. Right? So in other words, uh, all the reactions could be done together. Mm -hmm. Running the gel, you could have the whole genome in one gel lane. Then the problem was just, you know, like demultiplexing it. You you sort of multiplexed it. Uh, and uh, so uh, the, the idea was to um, transfer it to a, a flat surface. Um, we tried a, a number of diff the, m many different flat surfaces that would work. And then probe it and image it and then probe it and image it. And that whole cycle of probing and imaging was the first inkling of next-gen sequencing. I mean, this was in uh, 83 or something like that, published in 84. So people were excited about it. I mean, we had no idea what was coming with next-gen sequencing, but they were excited because you could do it without cloning or PCR. You could do it without amplification. So you could get things like methylation and in vivo footprinting. So simultaneously, we gave a way to do sequencing uh, methylation and, and, and protein footprinting, um, all from, uh, essentially from nuclei uh, of cells. So the multiplexing part of it, I had had as a backup plan that if I couldn't sequence the whole genome in one, in one tube, in one lane, or, uh, then I would uh, reduce the complexity of the mixture by mixing a bunch of plasmids that had your favorite inserts in them, and then you could do Maybe, let's say 20 inserts, which is what I settled on um, later. But as it turned out, the, the whole genome sequencing did work and it had many applications. In fact, somebody wrote a book about it or a how to manual. And then, but then I said, well, the multiplexing um, might have certain advantages. Even though it's not the whole genome, it'll be more sensitive. I can now use non radioactive methods because they were not very sensitive. Um, but by uh, Reducing the genome size, I could increase the fraction of each target, and so that um, that was multiplex sequencing, which was the first paper I published at becoming a professor. In between, I had a short time as a postdoc at Biogen at UCSF, where I looked, where I worked on uh, stem cells, mammalian stem cells mostly, and then, uh, but but then that 1988 multiplex paper. Um, along the way to that, I developed uh, color metric sequencing, which was later used in, I think, all of the high schools in Seattle, uh, thanks to Lee Hood, uh, ironically using my color metric method rather than his fluorescent method, both of which are non-reactive, but I guess one was more expensive, it was early days. And then, um, and then I developed um, uh, Chemiluminescent, well, and yeah, chemiluminescent, which was the main one that was used at Genome Therapeutics, and then um, with Peter Richterich uh, uh, coming into the lab was key in that.
And that changes from being the biggest radioactivity user in Harvard to the lowest radioactivity user, because we finally came up with a molecular biology tool, major one, that, that was non-radioactive. And then, uh, then fluorescence was the third method that we used was non-radioactive. So the multiplexing was uh, a step towards next-gen sequencing. It was a step away from radioactivity. Um, and it was combined with automation immediately. Even the genomic sequencing, we really didn't automate it. Um, even though I had developed the automation software back in 77, 78, um, it, it wasn't super popular. In fact, Greg, Greg when he first heard that I was doing this, he says, what do you want to do that for? That's, the, that's like the only fun thing of DNA sequencing is sitting down with your coffee and reading the, the gels. So I kind of put that on the, on the side in 78, but uh, it came back out in 88 when we did the multiplexing. <laughs> right. Well, I heard about it from, from myself. Uh, okay. I, was, I was one of, the pe one of the first people yeah. to talk about it. But the first meeting, uh, first meeting uh, where it was discussed that I know of was indeed the Alta 1984 meeting in Alta, Utah. I wouldn't call it an organizational meeting. It was aimed at a, a different topic. It was kind of a hijacked Shanghai meeting uh, where uh, there was a very small number. It was like 10 scientists were invited. Um, I was the youngest. Uh, and um, it's a mutation, right? It was about, it was estimating mutation rates that might in some way be the consequence of atomic energy or other atomic bombs or so forth, and, uh, or, or even non-atomic and other energy sources, anything that could cause it. And so there was a congressional mandate to estimate this. We concluded in the first five minutes that it was not feasible uh, at the moment, certainly. And the best we could do was um, maybe with uh, at a dollar base, we could sequence human genomes, or actually a human genome is the way it was phrased. Um, and that would eventually lead to some other error, es uh, estimate of error induced by energy. Um, but the point was, we could do this. And, you know, we didn't know whether the, anyone was going to listen or not, because we knew, we knew we weren't answering the mandate of the meeting. Uh, uh, which also ha it was sponsored not just by DOE, but also by the Office of Science and Technology. It wasn't, it was OST, I think at that time, right, or that OSTP. And, uh, and it went back to DOE and went back to the uh, Office of Science and Technology. And, uh, and at DOE, um, they just started, they, they, they got excited about it and they started writing checks, um, mostly internally. Uh, DOE had it. Had, Two, three small advantages. They were already up to speed on uh, fluorescence activated chromosome sorting, so they could make chromosome specific libraries. They were good at bioinformatics because George Bell had done more or less what I had done, except typed in a whole lot more sequences. And, uh, and then they were also good at robotics right. because they had, they had all kinds of robotics for handling radioactive substances and so forth. And then NIH had strengths as well, mostly in mapping, human genome mapping, um, and in model organisms. But at that point, nobody was talking about model organisms. It seemed like the, I was the only person at the first three meetings, one of which was not organizational, and you could argue the next two were. So it was uh, uh, the DOE, then Santa Cruz, which was sort of independent, you know, sort of university-run thing, and then DOE again in Santa Fe. And, uh, and all of them were talking about the human genome. It was a human genome. It wasn't even a diploid human genome. It was, a hap it was just three billion base pairs. Pretty much all of them came to the conclusion of what dollar base pulled out of the air, because I know the average student could not pull it off for a dollar base um, at that time. And certainly that it was completely neglecting the, the issues of, of repeats and scale and, and so forth. Uh, but they figure as a dollar base, there was, almost, there was essentially no automation. There was little m murmurings of automation in Japan. And, uh, and Watson was like being very nationalistic. Uh, uh, J Jim took me aside at a wedding at Cold Spring Harbor and said, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the Japanese are going to just, you know, eat our lunch. They're going to take all of our, you know, uh, economic uh, wherewithal in, in genomics. If you don't do something about it, um, 
uh, which is sequence E. coli. And I said, well, you know, you know, great. <laughs> you know, I'd love to have them join. But anyway, they, they had Fuji was involved, and they, had, um, they were building um, sort of an automated process for making films, which were gels. So gels were like automated, built more or less the way that film, the, 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 a photographic film was made. And so it seemed like a natural thing for them. Um, and then they had a lot of other robotics manufacturers who were interested. Um, and I went over to Japan around that time, and, uh, and it was quite impressive. It was like shock and awe of the, of the day. But they dropped out. Uh, Fuji decided it was too flaky. It would hurt their reputation if they had bad quality of any sort. So they dropped out. The robotic manufacturers, I think, realized that having a robot do exactly what a human does is actually not cheaper than a human uh, at that time. Um, in fact, still to this day, if you want to do something with a robot, it's best to do it in a way that's quite different from the way the human does it. So when we got the next-gen sequencing, when we developed the first next-gen sequencing device, it didn't look like a robot at all. There was no robotics involved because everything was essentially, again, in one tube um, or a, a, and spread out over a slide. Um, and it was essentially microscopy. You had a microscopy with a lot of um, moving parts. So anyway, um, that, was, that was sort of 84, when, 84 to 86 when the first three meetings occurred. Right. So, um, so in 87, it seemed like it was going to be a real thing because in 87 they started giving out grants. I think I might have been the first grant, first genome project grant in 87. It was a very modest one. In fact, everybody was joking about how I didn't know how to ask for a DOE grant because it was like, I think it was like $100,000 a year or something like that. And most DOE grants were in the many, many millions of dollars uh, intramurally. Uh, and, uh, but it seemed like a real thing then. And then NIH started getting excited about it. And then the whole biological community kind of said, no, we can't let this happen. We can't let NIH get involved. They didn't, we weren't so worried about DOE because DOE was already this kind of this Byzantine, mostly intramural thing. And there wasn't really any way for an NIH researcher to get into the DOE. Uh, I mean, I came in straight out of the blue. I wasn't even, uh, didn't even have a lab when I first started talking to them. Um, and, uh, and so when NIH started getting interested, then people freaked out. And, and there was almost a letter every week to Science or Nature saying why this is a bad idea. You know, I think if it had been put a vote, it would probably been 99 to 1. But fortunately, Jim Watson was involved, and he was pretty charismatic, and he went, I mean, not the word that everybody would use to describe Jim, but anyway, he went and talked to a lot of congressmen, and, and, uh, and it became a separate line item, as I recall. Um, there was also around that time, I think it was in 87, there was an NRC, NAS NRC, to look into this, um, and uh, Maynard and I were outside. Uh, Consultants. We weren't part of the committee. Uh, Mater became part of the committee uh, later, but uh, um, th that was that. I think was part of the process of figuring out whether you could do it or not. And uh, you know, eventually, NIH felt that they couldn't let the Department of Energy run what could be the biggest bio and best biology project in in decades. Um, and I think they would. So they started working together, and then. Then kind of, it, then it seemed like DOE was, I think, more technology or, uh, oriented, but NIH, since they mo mostly their strength was model organisms and mapping, it became a model organism mapping project, uh, for better or for worse. Um, and I think a lot of the mapping stuff was uh, distracting. Um, uh, but they uh, uh, eventually got back to sequence. Sequencing was then, the, so the first round of, of proposals, I was involved in three of the NIH and two of the DOEs. So that in addition to mine, there was a, another one from Ray Gesslin's lab in Utah for, for the DOE. So we were the two DOEs I can recall. And then uh, NIH, uh, oh, maybe four, uh, Jenny Mao was at Collaborative Research, later become Genome Therapeutics. They were doing mycobacterium, leprosy and tuberculosis. And then Wally Gilbert was doing mycoplasma, which is different from mycobacteria uh, at Harvard. And then um, at Stanford, it was uh, David Botstein and Ron Davis. Um, and I've had many interactions with both of them, all of these people since then. And then the fourth one 
um, was uh, Eric Lander. So he was his, it was his first grant, my second grant, um, and, uh, and it was all, these were all in the same stack and they all got funded. Um, and uh, he did his on mouse, and it was mostly mapping. It was like four out of five specific games were mapping. All the other th three from NIH and two for DOE were all about sequencing. And, uh, and then he had one sequencing section, which was written by Lenny Garanti and I. And even it was only partially sequenced. It was mostly CDN CDNAs and yeast, or something like that. Um, just a little bit of sequencing in it. But that, as soon as we got the grant, that started to like, take over, at least they would do all the mapping they would do by sequencing if they could, and, uh, and then it grew from mouse to human. And it, so that was, uh, so I would, I, would, I would work with them because of proximity, but I, was, but I would work with the other teams because I was interested in sequencing. And it ended up, most of the sequencing was done with my methodology. Well, for, there were all five of, five of the six published using the multiplex sequencing at some point. But the one that did the most with it was the collaborative research, which became Genotherapeutics. They, they actually sequenced uh, uh, several whole genomes with it. So I knew Eric well before that. He was uh, <clears throat> in the Harvard Biolabs. When I was a graduate student, he was uh, kind of a visiting professor from the business school, I think. And he was hanging out with Peter Cherbis and Bill Gelbart. Uh, Bill later went on to have a major role in databases, uh, right. even though at the time he was a fly geneticist with like, very little interest in computers. Um, but anyway, Eric would, would hang out with Bill and learn genetics. Um, and then, and then I, I went off and did my postdoc and, and didn't have much contact with him again until I came back as assistant professor. And then we started talking again. Around that time, he was doing a lot of work. He had, decided, he had done a series of rotations, you know, even though he was a a lecturer at the Harvard Business School. He had worked with, not only with Bill and Peter, but also with uh, uh, Hor Bob Horvitz and with David Botstein. I think the one with David was the most successful of his uh, rotations, where he did a lot of the math behind ideas that David Botstein had had for, I think, for years. And they together were able to implement these things in, in either math or software, or both. And, uh, and so he was well known already, even though he had not done any experiments. Um, he may have still not done any experiments as far as I know. But anyway, uh, so, when, so when we developed a center together, I think he was one of the <coughs> uh, um, uh, biggest in that most of the other ones were picking a human chromosome. And I think uh, it was smart to pick uh, a whole genome because, as it turned out, whole genome approach was a better approach than the chromosome approach. And in the end, uh, the human genome was done by whole genome. In fact, if, in a way, we weren't aggressive enough. It should have been whole genome shotgun from the beginning, which was what I was advocating um, all the way through. But at that time, around 80, late 80s and early 90s, almost every genome meeting you would go to, all the technologists, I mean, there were very few technologists, but all the people who called themselves technologists were aiming for 1x coverage. That was like the holy grail, was 1x coverage. And I just would shake my head and say, are you kidding me? The holy grail should be bringing the cost down so you can do one, any x coverage you want to, right? But that was just very unpopular sentiment at the time. Um, even though Fred Sanger, uh, you know, had already developed shotgun sequencing, but to some extent, people considered Fred was not a major com com component of these conversations. Uh, he, was on his, he was on his way to retirement, and I think most people considered him like a freak of nature that could do things that nobody else could do, and, and just who, who knows. But he, and he was much more of a technician than a, than a uh, you know, like a, a leader in a sense. I mean, he, he certainly had leadership skills uh, in the sense of setting an example. But he didn't, he didn't have a big lab. He had like typically one technician in the lab and an occasional visitor his whole career, even though he got two Nobel Prizes. Uh, but anyway, you know, when he would come to visit our lab, he would come sit in the room that I worked in, and he would spend all his time talking to the technician in the room. He'd be talking about how much T-Med they used and, you know, what percentage gels and all this sort of stuff. And that was, he was very uh, focused. Um, so. Anyway, so 
Fred's shotgun sequencing did not have a big impact at the beginning. And, and one by one, each of these labs had to learn the value of 7x coverage or more. Now, all organs were great. I, I, was, I was super, uh, in fact, I think I was the first one at the very first, every, every, all the first three meetings, I said, no, we need genome sequence comparisons. Comparisons means you have to have something to compare to. You have two genomes. Some will be closer to this, some won't. And I said, and we might as well start with small ones so that we get some payoff early on, rather than spending 15 years and then hopefully having a payoff at the end. Let's get a bunch. And that was not popular either. So but most of the things I was proposing were not super popular. Um, but what, what did happen is it was almost in, to, in order to, to uh, deal with the critics uh, between 87 and 90, between the DOE and the NIH starting, uh, it, it was very politically adept to bring in malorganisms. That's what helped change David Botstein from a critic into a, a supporter of the sequencing. He was always high on genomics and genetics, but to specifically support the Genome Project, it helped to have yeast as part of the game. Um, and then uh, worms were obvious because uh, Sulston Waterston had already done a lot of mapping. I mean, they basically had all the clones in hand to go. Um, and that's also what influenced the enthusiasm for mapping is because it worked so well in C. elegans. It didn't work so well in, in humans. Uh, and uh, so those were obvious models. Flies came in surprisingly late uh, in the game. And then bacteria got in as, as an organism. It was very funny that we call it the bacterium, you know. And it meant, it meant a bunch of bacteria, mycobacteria, E. coli, Haemophilus, mycoplasma, from both Wally's lab and, and Craig's, um, and so forth. So, so they were all lumped in together as if it was one organism because they were so small. You know. Yeah, he was very significant, I think. Uh, so uh, when that 1990 grants went in, where I worked with Jenny Mao and Ron Davis, David Bostein were together, and then Wally and Eric, uh, the, the Bostein Davis grant, um, um, had in it, it was a beautiful grant. I think it was the best of all the grants that I saw. Um, it got the worst score. I mean, it was essentially rejected, um, but it eventually, it was overridden. Um, but uh, it, it, it projected pretty accurately in a detailed manner all of functional genomics. It was all in that grant. Um, you know, just all this beautiful biology and technology and with yeast as the perfect way to test it out. It was at least a eukaryote, so it was better than all these <coughs> bacterial genomes. It was just a beautiful grant, and it got, just got trashed. I mean, uh, Maynard and I were there for the site visit, and we could tell from the very beginning of the site visit that they had just came in loaded with loaded shotguns, ready to take us out. And uh, um, Ron, um, so at the time, there were two ways of doing microarrays. One of them was Pat Brown's, the other one was Affymetrics, and Ron had bet on the Affymetrics, which I think in the end was the correct bet. In fact, totally correct bet was not a raise at all for, for uh, uh, sequencing or for RNA analysis. Um, it's still useful for, for SNP analysis. But anyway, Ron ha just went on to do all kinds of uh, innovative technology, and, he, and that the legacy of that center was Ron's technology center, which is still in existence uh, today. Um, and just so many uh, interesting technologies have come out of there. Well, like I said, I mean, he was uh, he was big on nationalism. He was uh, persuasive on getting. Um, uh, Congress to vote for it, um, support it, of getting NIH up to speed as a, at that time it was not a institute, it was a center. Um, and, uh, and I think he, he, he led to something that was a serious enough effort that it had to become an institute. Um, and uh, I think he recognized the value of the genome from very early on. I mean, I, I don't remember him being one of the doubters that had to be con convinced. Um, uh, yeah, he seemed, he seemed pretty compelled uh, uh, from the beginning. But other than that, I don't, I don't really, really remember uh, much about his role. Uh, I mean, Cold Street Harbor was one of the places where annual meetings would occur. Um, 
and Coles Marine Harbor was also some of the grantees. Um, um, but I don't think that had anything to do with why he did it. I mean, he, he felt it was the, the next big thing to do. Coles Marine Harbor had a good meeting structure already right. for courses and meetings, mainly during the summertime, um, including meetings that he had gone to when he was uh, a uh, postdoctoral fellow. Um, uh, and, he, and he announced uh, some of his work on the DNA structure in the early days of molecular biology. So that he had a warm feeling for Colson Harbor and became uh, the head um, many years later. And it, ha it had an infrastructure for uh, having exciting meetings, relaxed um, uh, meetings. So, so I think that that and Santa Fe became the two main meetings. Uh, there were also meetings held at uh, Hilton Head, um, called GSAC, um, Genome Sequencing Analysis Conference. They tended to be a little more focused on sequencing a little bit earlier, while the other meetings were mapping and sequencing. Um, uh, but I, I went to all those meetings for a while uh, until they got into heavy into production sequencing, and I kind of lost interest and went to the other things. Yeah, very, very rarely, uh, almost okay. not at all. I mean, it was not an NIH grantee, right? So I was a DOE grantee, I still am, since 1987. Uh, I was not a, I never got an NIH grant of my own until um, 2004. Right, the SEGS. The SEGS grant, yeah. So I think that might have been part of it. Um, I mean, I, I in a certain sense, had one through my collaborations with Collaborative Research and Stanford and uh, MIT and, and Wally's at Harvard. So in a certain sense, I had four, but I, didn't, I got zero dollars out of any of those four, I mean, to my lab, um, interestingly. So Eric got 19 million, and I got zero um, from that first grant. Um, so it shows uh, how good a businessman I was. Uh, <laughs> But I was, I was very dedicated and I worked hard on any, any one of those who, who wanted me to work on it. But it, it, didn't, it didn't land me as an obvious advisor to NIH. So I was an advisor to the NRC, the NAS NRC in 87. Um, but I didn't really get that heavily involved in the NIH efforts uh, until I got to SEGS. And also when the $1,000 genome launched roughly around there during uh, Zerhouni's uh, era, I think Francis got the bug of, uh, they weren't called Grand Challenges, what were they called? Roadmap. Right, Roadmap. Right, yeah, Was that, there were, there were, anyway, there were like 11 different possible roadmaps, and I showed up, I, I did advise on that one. Um, this was around. Resequencing re the biome, is that? Is that no, no, it was, that, it was, it was, that was one of them, but there was another one on technology. Oh. And, and I, and I, uh, I was, Big, it's one of the few times I was right, yeah. pretty emphatic. Actually, I was pretty emphatic all the way through the project. I mean, my meek version of emphatic, um, which was they should invest more in technology because it was my gut feeling that the return on investment in technology would be bigger than the return on investment of the sequence itself, um, both of which were significant. But I think that once they got serious about technology, the price plummeted by three million fold. Um, and almost none of that price plummeting was due to... Uh, was traceable to anything that happened during the genome project. It, uh, in other words, there were a lot of things that, a lot of technology development during the genome project, kind of minor incremental things, but they all just went out the window as soon as NextGen came in because the only thing that we really used from the old days was shotgun sequencing, which is we use big time in NextGen. But shotgun sequencing predated the genome project. Right. It was, and in fact, it was mostly ignored in the first four years of the genome project. Um, so anyway, I, I think that uh, there should have been more technology development from day one. And, and that, finally, that was listened to around 2000, and, I don't know, two, two or three, when they started, uh, they started thinking about the project, uh, the $1,000. And even the $1,000 was too radical. Uh, they had to couch it in terms of a $100,000 and a $1,000 project. So I probably liked Craig more than most people. Uh, uh, throughout the years, uh, we would keep kind of tackling the same problems, I think, mostly independently. Um, so, like, we both were attracted to small genomes um, uh, early on and, you know, arguably 
the, the collaborative research did the first small genome, which is a helicobacter, right. but Craig and Ham did the first uh, really peer-reviewed one, which was Haemophilus, that was in 94 and 95. So that was one example. And we, we also both got the photosynthesis bug about the same time as part of the DOE. We both also did uh, Ham and I, I'm including Ham uh, Smith as part of this because uh, he was essentially second in command to Craig and did a lot of the real technology side of things. Ham was the one that made all the shotgun libraries and he was the one that proposed synthesizing a genome and he got uh, DOE funding for that, um, even, even though they hadn't put out an RFA for it. And so then I, I did the same thing about the same time. And the personal uh, genome project was very similar to Craig doing himself. The difference was I got our appro the approval and he didn't. But they were the same kind of ideas that you could have an identified individual. And he, he started out not identifying himself, but then later did. We started out identifying ourselves. Anyway, there were many times where we would do similar things. The biggest difference uh, that he's acknowledged um, publicly is that I was much more into technology development. He would, he would say at meetings, George will develop technology and we'll use it, uh, which was very, I thought, very gracious of him. And I tried to return the compliment as, as much as I could. Uh, and that, and so, uh, you know, and he was. He was an early adopter of everything. And I think that really distinguished him early. I think that, that really, um, was the first thing, was uh, in 87, I think, he had an NIH lab full of ABI equipment. He was a protein chemist, and so most of the ABI equipment was protein. And he had a, a big budget, but n very little room for people. I mean, a typical NIH budget, you could get equipment, but not people. Um, and so he had to have, like, really automated equipment. So when they came out with the DNA sequencer, he didn't really feel that he absolutely needed one, but he felt, why not? It's another ABI machine. Let's get it. And he got one of the first ones. He even got one before Lee Hood did, even though Lee's lab had developed it. They didn't have the budget to buy one, as, as I understand it. Uh, but Craig did. He got one. He was a pretty good biochemistry know-how, and so they, like, optimized the protocols a little bit. And then he did something very clever. So he's, he's still at NIH. He... Uh, ordered the cDNA clones from clone tech. So cDNA was a good choice, first of all, because it was got rid of all the junk DNA problems. So 100 times smaller problem in principle. He then sent the cDNA clones from clone tech to collaborative research, which is where I had my center. And they, they would take in laundry. They would do contract work for other people. So they made plasma preps for them. They would send the plasma preps to NIH where uh, ABI technician together with one of his technicians, would run it on the ABI machine. So essentially he was using a third company to do the sequencing. And then he would run it without, I mean, he wouldn't, he would run it without annotation, without proofreading, straight into NCBI. And so the whole thing was like almost a paper project. It's like clone tech, collaborative research, ABI, NCBI. And to some extent just had to like, make sure, just do little quality checks that everything's going okay. And I thought that was brilliant. Um, but a lot of people got angry. That was one of the first things they got angry about. Before they even got angry about the patents, which wasn't his fault, they got angry about the quality. Because a lot of the reads were going in, and they, they weren't even human. They were unreadable. They were, or the good ones had a 3% error rate, right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people said, ah, oh, shouldn't even be in the database. But other people, like I think uh, maybe it was Bert Vogelstein or so, so several of the cancer people went in there and they poked around. They found a bunch of cool oncogenes and uh, cancer-related things like uh, uh, mismatch repair and so forth. And uh, so the people who had the prepared mind knew how to use it. Um, so anyway, then, then the NIH did what a lot of public and private institutions did is they started patenting this because it seemed like it was a good thing. And I, I'm not sure whether Craig, I don't think Craig initiated that. I think he went along with it. And then, the, then that got press. I was like, oh, this is horrible. <laughs> you know, we're, we're patenting the human genome. Um, even though it was these low quality CDNA reads, uh, which didn't have a, an application. You really need to have an, you need, it had to be not only non-obvious, but useful. And a CDNA read was not, I mean, other than uh, what people were doing, which was searching databases with it. 
And um, so that got the, the interesting aspect of people getting upset about things is it usually results in the opposite of what they want, right? The, the more you raise the, the alarm in public, the more likely it's going to get more money. So the three examples that I, that I was very close to was the common at the NA. That attracted so much attention that it basically sparked investors to invest in Genentech and, and Biogen and, and Cetus and Amgen and so forth. And just boom, out of nowhere, they, they got excited about uh, biotech. And then the cDNA debacle and then the stem cell. Um, for eight years, NIH wasn't funding stem cells. So California raised $3 billion. I mean, I'm not sure there would have been $3 billion spent in the whole United States on stem cells if there hadn't been this ruckus. So anyway, so finishing off, you know, where I feel Craig's role in all this was, was that, that was the start. I mean, he was really not well known prior to that, but then he formed these, these uh, related nonprofit, for-profit, which was Tiger and HGS. And that was a, a brilliant business deal right off the bat because the HGS funded Tiger um, all Tiger had to do was give them cDNA sequences. Eventually, Craig got tired of that relationship, and he bought back Tiger so it could be an independent institute, uh, by that time getting lots of grants. And then, uh, then he, then I think, uh, then he did, he had this race for the genome, which I didn't think was, you know, I mean, it was just using available technology. He had an inside track with ABI. Uh, which was a good thing, obviously. ABI's got a, a better chance of winning, f fighting with its uh, customers uh, because it, it has unfair. Uh, so that was, that was brilliant, too, business strategy. Um, and then uh, after the genome was prod the project was over, then when he got disinterested in human gen genetic or sequencing pretty much for a while, went off in synthetic biology. Using sequencing as a leverage to, to, to get people interested in, in his synthetic interests. You know, he would sequence, you know, metagenomes and things like that. But anyway, so in terms of the human genome, I'm not sure. It probably was a good thing to get kind of forced shotgun down everybody's throat. I think he did that. Uh, uh, I tried to do that, but I was completely ineffective. He was very effective. Uh, um, and, and uh, there was a period of time where people were doubtful that you could do whole genome shotgun on human and mouse. In fact, I was part of a paper that, that uh, um, on how to do that, a, a computational paper. Uh, Gene Myers and uh, James Weber from Marshfield um, did a paper. I was a co-author on that, but it took my name off at the last minute. I just, I don't know, I don't know why I regret it. but. Uh, um, and I believed that you could do shotgun on any size genome. Uh, and uh, anyway, so he forced people to agree. And even after he did the human and mouse genome, there were still people arguing that it was not feasible or, you know. And, I, and, uh, and they asked, uh, uh, there was a PNAS paper written by uh, Eric and I think it was Bob and uh, John, uh, where they, they kind of like critiqued uh, the the uh, whole process, and I said, well, why don't you, in your critique, address the mouse genome? Because there really wasn't much mouse mapping, scaffolding at the time you did that, and that kind of showed that you could do it. Um, and they, they just didn't want to uh, uh, have any part of that. Uh, and, and at the time, I, the reason they asked, or the reason Eric asked me was that at the time, I was the only person who had both, who had done both the venter and the um, I guess it was the Santa Cruz Golden Path or Golden Gate, I can't remember, uh, version in, in my lab. I mean, it, there were, the two sides were not sharing sequences, but they were both sharing them with me. And, uh, and so nature asked me to uh, compare the two. Um, and so, he, so they wanted to know whether I felt that the one was a derivative of the other. And in, in my opinion, it, it wasn't because when I, when I went and got the Santa Cruz genome, uh, it was actually in shambles. Uh, and uh, this is not, I think it's documented in our paper, but not very, not very aggressively. Um, so what we did was we went uh, to NCBI, 
where they had quietly put in an FTP site with no fanfare whatsoever an alternative uh, assembly of the human genome. Um, this is in 2001 where there was a bunch of, where there was a science paper and a bunch of nature papers. And, uh, and we looked at the two and we said, oh man, this NCBI one's so much higher quality. We don't want the public to look bad. We want to have the, put the best foot forward. We'll just kind of just call it the public genome. And I don't know if you saw the, the movie Contact, but there, it's a Carl Sagan oh, yeah. thing. And they build this, uh, this machine that allows interdimensional travel. And, uh, and some activists destroy it. Uh, um, well, I'm, hopefully I'm not ruining it for no, people no. who are listening to this. But there's a second machine that's built uh, in some, it's like a uh, rainy island of Japan. Anyway, that's what this was like. This was like the second genome. And the reason Santa Cruz was so messed up, well, first of all, they rushed it uh, with, a, with a small staff, basically one guy who was a hero, who was painted as a hero. Huh? This is Jim. Yeah. And, uh, but also the, there were some bits that were flipped um, that made it the assembly hard, that, that were NCBI bits, but they had misinterpreted what they meant. Anyway, uh, we, we compared the two and they looked pretty good. Um, they were very similar, but clearly independent, in my opinion. So that, anyway, the, the criti critics didn't want to hear that, uh, and I didn't really care. So, and I think, I think the answer is now everything's done by shotgun. Um, de novo sequencing and resequencing. It's hard to say because I think the main innovation there was the 3700 instrument. Okay. And it's possible that would have like galvanized everybody to go forward. It probably would have taken a little bit longer, but, but when you consider that the goal was a polished genome, I think we might have gotten a polished genome faster, we might not have gotten a draft slower. So in other words, rather than a draft in 2001 and a polished one in 2004, we might have gotten a polished one in 2003 actually faster rather than slower. Um, and the polished one got almost no attention whatsoever. I mean, uh, and, 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 and the other thing that might have happened is there wouldn't, hadn't been such a panic. I think we're just kind of warming up the idea of technology development. Uh, if there hadn't been a panic, then it might have been fewer 3700s bought and more alternatives sought. Um, and then, um, and we might have tried to finish the genome rather than produce a draft. I think all of that were possibly unintended consequences, negative unintended consequences of a race. Um, so, um, and part of it, I think, was stimulated by, there was a round of review where there were five centers, which was, uh, uh, it was uh, one in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, one in St. Louis, one in Baylor, Texas, uh, one at Collaborative Research, and one at um, Tiger. And they dropped the two that were not classical academic laboratories, right? So Tiger was nonprofit, but it clearly was part of a for-profit institution, that, and CRI was definitely for-profit. They dropped those two, and I thought that could have resulted in more innovation, or at least a different way of thinking. And also that stimulated Craig to go off and do his own thing. So I think that decision of dropping it from five centers to three was a poor management decision, um, maybe with hindsight. Um, but I think if there hadn't been a race, there might have been more, the one-upsmanship would be who's got the better genome, rather than who's got the first genome. And we, we still don't have, you know, it's, it's 16 years later, we still don't, haven't finished a single human genome anywhere, ever. Um, I hope to fix that soon, but... Uh, but, yeah, I, but no I, one's really encouraged, nobody's particularly encouraging of that, right? So you have to kind of do it on your own. Yeah, I think we should remind ourselves that it's not done yet. And it's some of the most interesting parts of the, of the right. genome, I think. The centromeres could easily be involved in uh, aneuploides, in uh, abortions, low birth weight, cancer. All that has to do with segregation of chromosomes, and that's what the that's that's centromeres are all about. So. Uh, I think it can be done. In fact, I think the method that will get the centromeres and the other gaps um, will be the method that will displace all the other methods, just like NextGen did. I, I knew Francis from his work on um, jumping, uh, genome clone jumping, uh, uh, and uh, 
and yeah. also from cystic fibrosis and a number of things he had done before he came. Uh, I, I didn't expect that he was necessarily going to be a fantastic manager. Um, I, you know, I, it just seemed like he was a regular postdoc, uh, like I was. Uh, and uh, but I know Eric uh, uh, was uh, quite in favor of it, and I think convinced Francis to to try for the position. Um, and it turned out I think he was really the leader that we needed. Uh, he was uh, sufficiently into the science. Um, that he, he knew what was right and wrong and, uh, and could help steer things, but wasn't so micromanaging that, that he would interfere with things. Uh, I think overall the, the NIH staff played a bigger role in those grants than almost any NIH staff in the history of NIH would be my guess. Uh, I, I, I could be wrong, but in terms of in extramural grants, they, they were often co-authors on papers. I mean, that's, that's pretty deep involvement. Uh, and uh, and Francis kept a very active uh, research of his own, which I think was uh, great. Um, um, now whether, I don't think, I, I, you know, I, you know I, I don't know what it would have been like with somebody else. Uh, uh, clearly, you know, I think J Jim might have been the perfect person to get Congress to vote for it. Because he just, I mean, just had more credentials than France. I mean, he was a Nobel Prize winner at a very young age and head of Cold Spring Harbor and so forth. He had some credentials. So it, if, if Francis had come in at the time Jim had come in, that probably wouldn't have been so good, even though it would have been a less rocky, there wouldn't have been the rocky exit. Uh, but I think Francis was the right one for that point onward. So I, I've already mentioned, I think some of the false starts were the mapping. Uh, right. Mapping turned out to be less interesting than it seemed at the time. Uh, and consumed almost all of our resources for the first five years. Um, so even though we ended up ahead of schedule, we would have been maybe a little, a little bit more. Um, and then the race, well, I consider a false start because it discouraged us from going for quality and it discouraged us from uh, technology development. Um, I think the next gen sequence, so, um, so who was involved? Uh, Sidney Brenner was, uh, uh, developed this MPSS method, which used beads, and I think the ultimate answer was in flat surfaces, not beads, but um, he was clearly a, a pioneer, and around 1994, he uh, published or patented MPSS, formed a company called Lynx. Lynx then uh, licensed um, some of my technology, the, some of the multiplex tagging and strategy, um, and I consulted for them briefly, and then they merged with Selexa and Illumina. So uh, you, and at the time, what was interesting is when those three companies merged, they didn't use any of their technologies. So Illumina was basically a, a, a bead SNP company. Lynx was a bead sequence by ligation company or cleavage and ligation. And then um, Selexa was a single molecule sequencing company in its original instantiation. They basically threw out all those, maybe kept a little bit of the microscopy idea behind links, and then um, in licensed some chemistry and amplification methods, um, and then just started running with it. Um, and there's still some dispute as to who invented the stuff that they and licensed it from somebody maybe other than the inventor. So Jingwei Zhu was a, clearly a pioneer in all of the next gen in the developing good, good reversible terminators for, uh, so getting peer-reviewed articles on it. I think we have to remember the peer review, not get so entangled with patents, uh, on uh, reversible terminators uh, for fluorescent sequencing and later reversible terminators for nanopore sequencing, which I think is still in the works, uh, but it is promising. So that the whole idea of sequencing by synthesis has been greatly helped by having those terminators. Um, what else? Uh, for quality, um, most of the quality came in with haplotyping, oddly enough. Uh, and uh, because it, it, in a way, it, it could have gone down with short reads because there's most of the quality, most of the errors have to do with read placement. So if you try to put something that's mildly repetitive onto a scaffold even, it, go, it, it doesn't know where to go. Um, but then haplotyping, 
And I think the first really good haplotyping was uh, complete genomics in 2012, where they figured out how to, like, break five to ten cells up into, like, fra fractional genomes into 384 well plates, and then each of those would be read. Uh, which is a, was kind of a mixture of 100 KB fragments, and it was as if you had done BACs, um, which, by the way, was also uh, an innovative thing early on in the Genome Project was BAC sequencing and BAC in, in cloning. YAKs were a bit of a distraction, but BACs were really the real thing. We had an excellent BAC library from Peter de Jong uh, very early on, and for some reason it was sidelined, uh, didn't use it. Um, I think it was because it was Peter de Jong's genome, and so he was no, a known individual, but they could have gotten IRB approval for that. Instead, they tried to make a diverse set of back libraries, which more or less failed. They ended up with a non-diverse single person again, just a de-identified single person, which I don't think is necessarily a plus. Uh, but anyway, that, the backs were, were good. Um, the, the not having the clone in the backs is even better, because, it, because then there were some cloning artifacts you would get and some sequences that weren't easy to go into backs. If you just fragment up the genome and uh, put it into a, uh, a uh, in vitro amplification, you ended up retaining uh, more of the genome. So anyway, that was, that was 2012. Uh, the Complete Genomics had published a previous paper in 2009, which was really the first, I think, in a, truly inexpensive genome. They, they had uh, consumables, meaning reagents and supplies and equipment amortization on the order of $1,500 per person back in 2009. Ranged up to $4,000, but it was in that, it's in that, it wasn't quite the $1,000 genome, but, um, uh, who else was, uh, I think that's, that's, that's it for innovations and, uh, and false starts off the top of my head, you yeah. know. I think there's relatively little logic because there are relatively la few labs that do it. So in academic labs, it's much more tempting to be an early adopter. You get labeled as a technologist if you're an early adopter. And in industrial labs, there's also a great emphasis on incremental growth and in, in licensing things that are invented elsewhere. Uh, um, typically that elsewhere will be some kind of hole-in-the-wall technology group uh, that uh, developed one particularly cool thing. I mean, it might be like uh, Stan Tabor and Charles Richardson developed sequinase. Um, that was, that made its way into the Genome Project for a while. And uh, Matthews and others developed capillary electrophoresis, uh, and that got brought into EBI. So it's a lot of this stuff where there, w there wasn't, there weren't labs that were really full-time doing technology development. They might be doing mostly analytic chemistry or mostly biochemistry, and they'd have an insight um, and, the, and then get in the so, so um, there are a few labs that were full-time technology. I would say Ron Davis's lab, Lee Hood's, and mine were arguably three of those labs. You, you could, it was hard to be academic or industry. You had to be kind of at the interface uh, a lot, uh, which is hard. Um, as in terms of patterns, so patterns within that, uh, I think the general pattern, most technologies get displaced, sometimes without a trace uh, other than the history. Uh, and it might last about a decade. A decade is a good length of time for technology to last. So, so our multiplex sequencing lasted about 13 years. Uh, Sanger's radioactive sequencing lasted a similar period of time, but with a, depending on how you count the fresh start with the fluore uh, fluorescence sequencing, it lasted a bit longer. But it all kind of depends on where you, it, I would consider it almost a totally new method, right? Because, um, you know, you're not taking the plates apart and slapping an x-ray film on it. Uh, you know, there's, there's just a whole lot of differences. So uh, you're running everything in one lane, rather than four lanes. I mean, just so different. The only thing they have in common was even the dideoxys weren't the same. They were the dye terminators and other innovations. So, um, so if, you know, 10 years is kind of, it takes about five years to go from a concept and a, maybe a preliminary paper to an instrument. Uh, so out of a rule of thumb. Uh, then, about, then, that, then that whole technology will last about a decade, and another one will come in. Sometimes it will build on top of it like the ABI did. Other times it will completely displace it like next-gen sequencing. There's not a, almost a trace left of the um, uh, electrophoretic era. Um, and uh, probably the next one might be nanopores, 
that doesn't quite fit the pattern perfectly in the sense that it's taken a whole lot more than five years to get from a concept sort of like 88 concept to barely working in 2016. So the first human genome was essentially sequenced with nanopore in 2016, the first bacterial maybe a year before that. Um, and that's kind of the gold standard now is can you sequence a human genome at fairly high accuracy? Um, so that took, you know, from 88 to 2016 to, to, to arrive. And I don't know how long it will last, but I think it has the, the highest probability of displacing um, the bi bi sort of big iron, the current big iron, um, because, you know, one chip, you could, you could probably fit, well, you could already fit 8 million sequencers, nanopore sequencers. Um, and that chip is cheap and reusable. Um, so you can imagine, and that could scale up to billions the way Ion Torrent did. Um, so um, anyway, that's, that's, those are patterns that I can see. Well, a part of it was single molecule is harder than multi-molecule. Um, it, it, so it was pretty noisy. And it, and it really required a complete redo. I mean, uh, both of the way people thought about electrophysiology. So when I s did the first patent on nanopores, I was thinking patch clamp, Sackman and Nehrer. Uh, and patch clamp doesn't scale at all. So the idea of changing, uh, I mean, just like next-gen sequencing required a rethink from electrophoresis to flat on a glass slide, we needed to move the patch clamp from this sort of artisanally crafted pour to something where you could have millions of them on a flat surface. In both cases, we were trying to ape, to mimic uh, silicon, silicon Valley's uh, or uh, microfabrication in electronics, where you have these super flat layers and you put, and you, uh, you use some combination of photolithography and self-assembly to put down the nanopores. <clears throat> anyway, that, even with hindsight, that probably was going to take a long time. Um, yeah. So, and the, and the other question is, is we, we... And it probably isn't that big a loss because right now, even with all the computer technology we have right now, the rate limiting point for the Genia nanopores is dealing with the data because you're getting terabytes of data from a little chip um, in short periods of time. And so we need to... And if we had had those terabytes of data back in the 80s, it, would just, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't even be conceivable what to do with it. Right uh, now, at least we can we could kind of tr trim off. We can we can <coughs> start building uh, field programmable gate arrays and GPUs right onto the chip, uh, and so do a lot of data processing on the chip. But a lot of it's in, if you do it really cleverly, it's incompressible data. I mean, the short answer is I think the thousand dollar genome was distinctly better than everything else for technology development, um, and and uh, and I was. Uh, not a big fan of chips, even, even though I was one of the first adopters of chips for, for a few demonstration articles. I, I was never, to me it was, uh, I was just playing with it to see if there was something there. And the main thing that I got out of chips was stripping the DNA off the chip. So I used it in a very perverse way, is rather than having them nicely ordered, uh, strip them off and started building big pieces of DNA out of them, or using them for making libraries. And to this day, that's the only thing I use chips for is uh, synthetic biology, not for analytic, which was the point of most of the NHGRI uh, efforts. I think NHGRI didn't get onto functional genomics early enough. I think the, the uh, ENCODE project, once it got started, was terrific. It, 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 in a way, it encouraged technology development. Again, not as aggressively as the thousand dollar genome. I think the SEGS grant program was the best of the best. It encouraged out-of-the-box thinking. It encouraged interdisciplinary, multi-teams, uh, multi not just uh, not just multiple collaborators or multiple people, but actual multiple teams uh, putting together innovative things. So it encouraged innovation, which is something you don't see often enough. Um, and as it happens, the SEGS grant happened to fund me for next-gen sequencing before the $1,000 genome grant program started. And so when it started, I didn't apply for the $1,000 genome grants because I already had the grant and I didn't want to do double dipping. Uh, 
And, but I thought both two of those were complementary. And if I had to choose, I would have, at that point, picked the SEGS. I mean, I'd already picked the SEGS before I knew the $1,000 Genome Project grant was going. Um, but I still would have picked it because it, 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 I think it was more intellectually exciting. I mean, I, I went to all the, almost all of the $1,000 Genome Seek Tech Dev meetings. In fact, I was on the grant review committee. I was chairing, chaired the grant review committee for a few years. And I loved them, you know, because they were full of physicists and um, engineers. Um, but the SEGS was full of, you know, innovation in biology. So they were very complementary. But I think those were the two real jewels in the crown, not just of NHGRI, but of all of NIH. The only thing that comes close to those two programs, in my opinion, are the uh, uh, transformative awards and the pioneer awards, because they allow you to do things that would not normally get funded in a particular institute. Most of the really, really cool things that people celebrate, or at least uh, and that I celebrate, are these interdisciplinary things that cross, cut across all the NIH institutes. Well, like I said, they had it sitting on their plate uh, with the Botstein Davis grant. And uh, the fact that they, that grant got rejected by peer review, um, fair and square, uh, it's just the wrong peer review. Um, and then it got re instantiated, but greatly reduced in budget. Um, I think that was the first sign. And then when, on the, when I was on the grant reviews for some of the genome, early genome project grants, we were given strict instructions no biology. And I think that was partly to develop a distinct portfolio for the NHGRI relative to the other NIH institutes. And, and later they started having like joint grants with other, I thought that was brilliant, you know, it was, uh, allowed more biology to come in. And it also effectively created a bigger fund for NHGRI related projects. But I think that was, it was partly it was kind of zone of inhibition from the other institutes that prevented NHGRI from doing functional genomics very early. Um, and there's a, there were always clever grantees that would figure out how to sneak it in. Uh, um, but, it, uh, and it, it is certainly quite healthy now for many years, but uh, took a while. So nanopores in terms of technology, uh, in terms of biology and technology, I would say in situ sequencing and synthetic biology. I remember we were at a SEGS meeting at Stanford. Long, it was one of the first SEGS meetings, and Francis was there. And, uh, and there was a Q&A period where people in the audience asked Francis questions. And uh, I think Roger Brent asked the question of, would NIH, NHGRI consider um, funding synthetic biology? And Francis gave a pretty quick answer, which was no. Uh, <laughs> and I raised my hand and I said, well, what if, um, you know, we had a program where you would do, um, uh, make targeted mutations to see what variants of unknown significance, what their physiological effects would be. So that would be sort of synthetic biology, but it would be testing the hypotheses that are flowing, you know, out of the Genome Project. And he gave a, a quick answer, which was yes. <laughs> so it's a really kind of a way it was framed. Um, and, that was, uh, and that was the basis, essentially, for our second SEGS. So the first one developed next-gen sequencing in, starting in 2004. And the second one was on uh, testing hypotheses using uh, genome engineering, which we proposed zinc fingers. And by the time we got the grant, we were already doing talons and then CRISPR. So, so in both cases, we kind of exceeded uh, what was going on. So anyway, so, so I think synthetic biology is going to have more and more impact on testing hypotheses and moving genomics. It, it, you, uh, you know, as often, uh, Feynman's often quoted, you know, you, to really understand something, you have to build things with it. Um, and then in situ sequencing, I think, is another one, more on the back to the analytic side, but, but working together with the synthetic side is as we build um, more um, you know, complex synthetic systems like organ, organoids and organs, possibly even for transplant, or testing hypotheses or testing drugs, um, you'd like to check that they're the real thing, and you'd like to understand how the genome, epigenome, plays out in every tissue of the body. Um, and it's still, there's many things that are limited by the fact that I don't know what all the cells are making. I mean, we don't have a cell atlas 
And there's, that's a rallying cry that's happening now. I think it has to be a really good cell atlas, ideally in C2 rather than, uh, you know, approximating every cell as a isolated sphere, not having any neighbors. Uh, in C2, you get the, the, the non-random distribution of proteins and nucleic acids throughout the cell body, what other cells surround it, but the, you know, morphology is important. So I think those are going to be the two big things, synthetic biology, testing variants of unknown significance. Uh, I think they'll be making it into the clinic. Um, uh, and you can consider gene therapy as a, a branch of synthetic biology um, or a sister of it. And then in C2, which could uh, help those two along. Well, I think the main barrier to PMI success is sharing of data, not, not the quality. But I, I think quality, we need to address the quality. I think democratization doesn't necessarily result in lower quality. Um, you know, for example, the quality of cell phones is much higher now than when only rich people could afford it. Um, uh, now there's 7 billion cell phones and 7 billion people, roughly, uh, not quite one to one. Um, I think that uh, uh, raw data can be quite poor and the consensus can be quite good. So for example, PacBio, even though it has the worst quality data, raw data, it has the best context. And so when we sequence a genome from de novo, we use PacBio, because Illumina results in 300 contigs, and the PacBio will put it into one contig per chromosome uh, right away. And the consensus is pretty good. Same thing for the nanopores. I think one of their advantages is going to be the, the uh, um, uh, long reads. So long reads get you high quality, just like haplotyping gets you high quality. Um, anyway, I, th I think it's not quite democratized when everybody's cell phone has a sequencer on it. Then I'll consider it democratized. Uh, and that that's, and there's, because then you'll be reading out your environment as you walk through life, um, and that will be reported out to the cloud. Again, sharing data is the key thing for precision medicine. I need to know when I walk into this room, everything that's in the air, everything that's in my food, allergens, pathogens, non-pathogens, et cetera. And that, that will be, that will be truly demand. And I think we're heading there. I mean, we've, we've got sort of, we're sort of in the thousand dollar genome now, complete with interpretation of genetic counseling. It'll probably be a hundred dollars soon um, because of companies like uh, BGI and Illumina's moving in that direction. They'll, they'll only move as quickly as competition forces them to move because they are a monopoly. And then, I would, and then the nanopores will be pushing both of those out of the way um, with potentially you know, $10 or less. Once it gets to a certain low level, it becomes democratized and it is free. Um, you know, Google Maps is free. A lot of Google services are free to the consumer. Some of them don't even require you to look at ads, right? Um, I think that's we're going there very, very quickly now. Um, at, at this point, a thou even $1,000, you can imagine a lot of companies could make money um, by uh, making it freely available.